The use of time has become something that's extraordinarily important. What if I were to treat my business life as an astronaut, but sit there and write out on a sheet of paper, what is it that I do that creates the most value? Doing that has meant millions of dollars of extra revenue. What was working isn't working as well right now from you personally upgrading your use of time. Maui Mastermind presents the Business Coach Podcast, answering your questions and providing real actionable insights for building a better, stronger, more profitable business without sacrificing your time, life, or freedom anymore. Hi, and welcome to this episode of the Business Coach so here's what I want to talk with you about today. I want to talk about time and how can you upgrade your use of time? How can you reclaim five or more hours each week of your time so that you can reinvest it in upgraded uses in your business? Now, this is something that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, many people have, over time have, have noted how, if they're being nice, they'll say how precise I am with use of time. If not, they'll say anal retentive. But over the 25 years I've run companies, built companies, sold companies, bought businesses, closed some, started others, the use of time has become something that's extraordinarily important. And from coaching several thousand other business owners, both one-to-one -one coaching at least three, four hundred business owners over the last 25 years. And over the course of working with our company, we coach several thousand business owners over the, that same period of time. And so I want to talk about how can you find the time, not by creating new time, but reclaiming time that you're already wasting. And here's the challenge for you right? How do I do the things that matter most for my business and do that even in the moment when I feel overwhelmed by way too much to do, a to-do list that never ends. I've got all these competing demands for my time and energy pulling me one way, pulling me the other, pulling me multiple ways at once. It's kind of like, do you, I don't know how old you are, but um, when I was a kid, one of the most popular toys was the Stretch Armstrong. And Stretch Armstrong, if you can think about this toy, was a toy that literally its whole purpose was it was uh, 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 a wrestler man that you pulled the arms as far as you could. And if you were a kid, your goal was to have you and your friends each pull on one arm and on the other arm at the same time to see if you couldn't stretch Armstrong to the point where he broke. And having worked with enough business owners and having felt this in my gut viscerally, sometimes business feels like that, like it's trying to break you, like it's Stretch Armstrong or treating you like Stretch Armstrong. You know, fires that you have to put out, complete, conflicting demands, drama from your staff. These are all things that are going on in your business. And so when you feel this way, how, how do you get yourself to do the most important things in the face of all that? You know, it's one thing to get yourself to do what's on your to-do list, but many times it hides what matters most, what's most valuable. How do you get yourself to work smarter, even in the face of all this overwhelm? And that's what this episode of the podcast is gonna be focused in on. And so I wanna start with a story. You know, once upon a time, it didn't matter for me in business if I worked long hours. When I started my very first successful company, which is company number two, company number one, I started at 22, it went under roughly 10 months later, lost my life savings, 3,200 bucks. But business number two went on to become an incredibly successful business, generating several million dollars of profit every year. Um, and it was what really launched me into the world of business. And back then, working 60, 70, 80 hours a week, it didn't matter to me. I mean, even after I got married to my wife, Heather, she was very supportive. And you know, if I wanted to, if business needed me to work more hours, I would work more hours. If the business needed me to work at night or on a weekend, I would do that. And then something happened that completely changed my life. Um, my first two sons were born, Matthew and Adam. Now I have three sons, Matthew, Adam, and Joshua. But when I held in the hospital, Matthew and Adam in my arms, working longer hours was no longer an option. I no longer was willing to do that. I, for the first time in my life, really and legitimately put boundaries around my work. Um, and I want to use an analogy that hit me. And the analogy is that of an astronaut. Think about an astronaut. He or she goes off into space, and they carry with them a certain limited inventory of air, oxygen, of water, of food, of fuel, these critical ingredients. And I started to say, what if I were to treat my business life as an astronaut? And what if I only had a limited number of, of inventory 
of number of hours to work. Now, way back in the beginning, I used to do a lot of travel for business, even when my kids were born. So I said, what if I were to, to limit my inventory of travel days and limit my inventory of work hours each week? I put a hard stop, said, I have 40 hours of inventory. How am I going to invest this 40 hours of time each week? And I said, I have only three travel days per month. Back then, I was traveling probably closer to seven to 10 days per month. With three travel days per month, how am I going to invest that? Eventually, I shrunk that to saying, how can I do that with three travel days per quarter? But at first, you have to start with where you're at. And when you look at your time that way and you approach it, what it does is it forces you with that limited inventory to focus not on the time that you work, but on the value that you create. And this is incredibly important. Jot that note to yourself. It's not about time or hours work. It's about value created. And when I make that there, it's not about the, the effort I put in. It's not about how hard I work. It's about how much value I create. And I realized that the first thing that got in the way of me creating value was I had actually never stopped to put in writing, what do I do that creates the most value? I mean, literally to sit there and write out on a sheet of paper, what is it that I do that creates the most value? Now, we created a tool around that inside the Maui community. We called this tool the Time Value Matrix. It's a, a four-page tool, but let me share with you the concept from it because I think it'll be very valuable for you. So when you think about time, initially, most people's distinction about time is they have work days and weekends, right? Weekdays, weekends. Later on, people start having some extra sensitivity around time, and they start thinking about Pareto's principle, that 80% of what we do, that D time, that low value time, that 80% of what we do um, gives me a very small return, gives me 20% of the results. So this D time, 80% mass, only gives me 20% of my return. And then Pareto's principle goes on to say that 20% of what we do, this kind of a high, higher leverage 20%, C time is what we'll call it, gives me 80% of the result. Think about that. Four times less work gives me four times more value. That means that every one hour of C time is 16 times more valuable than an hour of D time. Straightforward math. Four times less gives me four times more. That means every hour of C time is 16 times more valuable than D time. And most people never go beyond there. And for them, it'd be the equivalent of, um, hey, if I charge hourly for my time when I'm doing something that's billable, whether I'm a, a technician in the field or a consultant in the office, if I do something that's billable, that's C time, that's my high value time, I used to say, and anything else was D time. What I realized was, was that, that if I apply that 80-20 principle a second time, then if 20% of what I do gives me 80% of the result, then 20% of that 20% gives me 80% of the 80%. And that B time is what we define that as. It's that sweet spot 4% input that gives me 64% of the output. Now, I don't think the numbers are exact. However, I think the concept makes a lot of sense. If 20% of what I do gives me 80% of the result, then what about the 20% of that 20%? Now let's do it one more. Bear with me one more math moment. If 20% of my 20% gives me 80% of the 80%, what about the 20% of the 20% of the 20% literally giving me 80% of the 80% of the 80%? Now if all the math works out this way, A time says that magic 1% in gives me half out of the value I create. And when you think about this in terms of time, how does this affect you? How does this impact you? You know, if I were somebody who billed hourly, again, whether I'm a technician in the field doing blue collar service work, or I'm a, an attorney, a CPA or a doctor charging per procedure or hour of my time, if I'm billing that way, you, we used to think that the highest value of my time was being there doing something that was billable. But what you'll discover is, is that that's not the highest use of your time. For example, you know, I worked with one um, law firm. Um, they had, at that time when I first started with them, three attorneys. Um, today they have seven attorneys and they have two more that are on their uh, interview list right now. I talked with the owner recently. And for example, that owner of that, pre uh, of that firm, one of his highest uses of time was actually in the choice, the strategic choice of billing rates for himself, for the other um, attorneys, and also for their legal staff, their para, uh, paralegal staff. You know, 
we've worked with them, so we pushed up their effective hourly over the last eight and a half years we've been working with them, effectively doubling everyone's hourly rate in that time. How much of his time has it taken? It's probably taken him about four hours over the last eight years, maybe, maybe eight hours, no more than an hour a year, to, to have us prompt and remind him as his business coach to take a look at those hourly rates and look at the value he creates for his legal clients. Doing that has meant millions of dollars of extra revenue and profit over the years for his firm, much more valuable than him doing another billing process at $600 an hour. An hour of billing $600, an hour of being strategic about his business might have meant for him an extra half a million dollars of profit from that year. You tell me which was more valuable. One was truly a time, the other wasn't. Another example of this might be um, somebody, a manufacturer. Which product line are you going to invest to develop? Some of the manufacturers that we coach, they might spend half a million to two million dollars to develop a new product. You know, they have to get the tooling just right, the engineering and design work, all that before they've ever sold what it is that they're making in many cases. So the choice strategically of what to make is incredibly important for a manufacturer. You know, it might take them 10, 20, 30 hours to decide what to do, but when you're putting in half a million to two million dollars of development cost for that new product, that 10 to 30 hours is incredibly valuable. That's A and B level time for them. So going back to the comment was, without knowing in writing what your highest level activities are, what you'll find is you get stuck. And so let me give you an example for this here. Um, what we have clients do is we have them actually define out in writing what are, your, what are the results that you are most on the payroll to generate? What are the things that you do that create the most value? Ultimately, those are your A and B level activities. Um, another example of this that I would share with you is in my world. You know, I look at once upon a time 20 years ago, one of the most valuable things I could do would be to coach a business owner one-to-one. -one. Today's world, that's C time. It, it really is not a very high value use of my time. Hence, I don't coach very many clients anymore. That's not what, what my role is anymore with this part. For you, when you think about that, what did you used to do that was a high value but no longer is? Today, a much higher value is for me to work with our coaching director, Rich, for him to implement changes and improvements on our coaching quality with all of our coaches or to work with um, Kurt who runs our, our marketing side and, and he has me do a, a podcast like this once per week with that part. Having thousands of business owners listen to one, that's a much higher use of my time. The creation of that podcast, the niche of who we were working to reach business owners of companies that were already successful but wanted to break past that owner-reliant trap to build an owner-independent company and scale quickly, rapidly. That's our target audience. That decision took us probably five or six hours of back and forth conversation and to be clear on what it was and our strategy around it. The creation of a podcast like this each week, that would be B time for me. Working one-to-one -one with a client, that would be C time for me. And some of the other junk stuff that comes up in my email box or other places would, would be D time. How about for you again, what did you used to do that was valuable, but today is not nearly as valuable for you to do? I was having lunch with a gentleman who owns a painting business. Once upon a time, him being out there in the field, making sure the painting quality for their commercial projects or the residential painting side was high value. Today, he's got 25 crews in the field. Having him be out there in the field is not his highest value use of time in any means. So the question I have for you is I want you to think through on paper what are three of your A and B level activities and what are th three of your D level activities? Now, we don't worry about C time. C time takes care of itself. We look first and define what is my, my A and B level activities. Now, initially, it's going to be difficult for you to know what the distinction between A and B level time is. You, you recognize intuitively that they're more valuable than C time, but it's hard to have the refinement to see the gradations between the two. Over time, it'll become more apparent. But for now, you could even label through what are three to five of your A or B level activities. Write them out. And then on the other side, I want you to write down what are three to five of your D level, low value activities. The strategy we're going to deploy is how do we reclaim three, five, seven, ten hours of D time 
and put it into A or B uses. And by doing that, this is how we've watched clients that we coach grow 20%, 50%, 100% year over year, and to maintain that growth rate over five or 10 years by consistently themselves first and then their team, which we'll come to, reclaiming some of their D level time and reinvesting that A and B level uses. Now, we have to be honest about that though. What gets in the way? <laughs> I mean, I know a lot of people will say, you know, David, I, I know what my high value activities are, but doing those high value activities in the face of what I, I get confronted with in my day is very difficult for me. And that's honest. So let's look to that. I want to share with you what I consider the most important secret to actually carving out consistently blocks of time for your highest value uses. We're going to call this distinction focus days and push days. Now focus days are the one or two days a week that you block off a large chunk of time, two, three, four hours to do your highest value work, a focus block of time. A push day is you're just pushing getting the job that you're on the payroll to do done. You're just pushing projects the next step to the next step to the next step. Now, the way I want you to think about this is I want you to think again about the inventory of hours that you have. So I'm going to share with you an example that you have your typical week here. So now your typical week, you might say that you have a 40 hour work week. So here's a typical week on a schedule. And so what we're going to do is we're going to block out that every Tuesday, we're going to block out from nine to 11 right? That two hour block of time or a three hour block of time, depending if you start at eight, for your focus time. You're not going to do low value stuff. You're going to put that in your calendar as an appointment with yourself to do your highest value work. And then on your push days, your Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, in this example, you're going to make sure you carve out one hour of focus time each of those days. What you've done is you've brought in four to as maybe as much as eight hours of focus time into your life. And, and when you think about it, you don't need to have eight hours of your very highest focus time every day. It's really difficult to do. But if you can even just have one day a week that you carve out a two, three, four hour block, and in that block you put your highest value project or activity for that, for whatever you're working on, a very big value for you to be doing that. All right. So I want to go to the next part here. I want to share with you an example of what my typical week looks like. Not for any other reason than this is how I've done it. Now, having done this for over, what, 15 years now, I actually make Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays my focus days, three days a week at this point. And so if you were to look at my calendar, you would see that every Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday morning, I'd have a three-hour block of time. And then I would usually typically have one to two hours more in the afternoon after a break for some lower value work in there. And actually for me nowadays, I, I like to actually watch Premier League soccer. It's one of my guilty pleasures. So I'll usually take in the middle of the day, half an hour to an hour, depending how good the game is. I'll watch a half of soccer, fast forward through some of the duller moments um, and enjoy that. Now for you, you might not do it that way. Again, you might go back to our other example here. You might have it where it's one day a week that you have a two or three hour block. But here's the most important part of this. You don't have focus time by merely saying, oh, I'm going to have focus time at this moment. I've got to plan ahead. I've got to pick my focus time and day for that. I, I literally need to think this through in advance. That's my, as your business coach, this is me telling you, pick the one day a week to start with that you're going to build a two to four hour block of time that you're going to put in your calendar as a recurring appointment. Think about that for a moment, a recurring appointment. Um, I'm going to start off by sharing a quick story. I was talking to, to one of our clients, his name's Jesse. Um, I was doing a keynote at an industry conference. This was, well, gosh, I don't know how many years ago, five, six, seven years ago. And Jesse was part of that industry. And I, uh, he was a client that just happened to be there. And so he came up, we had a conversation. And I said, hey, Jesse, how's it going? He's, you know, he had had some really good early success in the business coaching program. And in his construction company, they had you know, essentially double profitability. But he told me, he said, David, I'm starting to feel frayed. I'm feeling pulled in lots of directions. What was working isn't working as well right now. And as he described this and told me about it, after about a minute or two, I knew exactly what was going on. Now, one of the benefits of being a business coach to directly hundreds of business owners and then through our company, thousands of business owners, I get to notice patterns. So I'm a really good pattern um, observer of patterns. And so I just turned in, I asked him a question because I knew exactly what was going on. I said, Jesse, show me your phone. 
I said, show me your phone. And uh, he looked at me like, what, what do you mean, show me your phone? I said, show me your phone. What I am going to bet is, if I were to look at your phone, I'm not going to see blocks of focus time as recurring appointments on your calendar. I know you used to do that, but I bet you've gotten out of the habit. And as you've gotten out of the habit of having blocks of recurring time, in our example here, we had every Tuesday from 8 to 11, every Thursday from 4 to 5 p.m., those blocks of time that you know you can count on to push away the world to fit in your high value creating activities two, three, four times a week. I bet you've gotten away from that, haven't you? And he looked a little bit uh, chagrined and he said, yes, I have gotten away with that. I said, great. Now you're going to be at our next conference as part of the coaching program in about two months. When I see you there, guess what one of the first things I'm going to ask you to do is? And he laughed and he knew exactly where I was going with this. It was going to be, show me your phone. It's a really important thing. If I don't see that in somebody's um, calendar, then I know that they're not taking that focus time. And, and I want you to think about it this way. I'm going to actually you know, think of it as an analogy. If you could imagine that, that you have a bucket, and that bucket is your inventory of time. And so for some of you as business owners, that's going to be 40 hours a week. For some of you, that's going to be 50 hours a week. For some of you, that might be 25 hours per week, whatever your inventory of time is. If you think about that as the, the bucket of water, what I want you to do is I want you to carve space by putting in a two or three hour focus block once a week at a minimum. And then maybe one or two other smaller one hour or 90 minute focus blocks. And what that does is that you crowd out the D-level activities. It's hard to eliminate D-level stuff. It's going to be pulling for your attention. But when you put an appointment to say that during this time I'm going to be focused on my highest value activities, what that allows you to do is it allows you to keep at bay by putting something in to displace the low value. It's kind of like a, the buffet theory of, of, of time management. If I go to a buffet and there's all kinds of delicious stuff like um, you know, desserts and junk carbohydrates and all kinds of fried stuff, if I can make sure that my first plate of food is nutritious, high quality protein, vegetables, um, really good stuff, then I'm gonna eat less of the crap stuff with my second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth plate. The same thing applies when I look at my week. If I can build in four, six, seven hours per week of focus time as recurring appointments, like I suggested for Jesse to go back to, then the rest of the week I can do what I want with in general, but the value will get primarily created from those focus blocks of time. Now, what gets in the way of this? You know, let's be honest about it. staff interruptions, you know, clients demanding of your time, um, tempting distractions that are things that you're interested. Again, go back to it. I just need to make sure that my first um, part of the week, as I design my week, that my first things I put into my calendar are the high value creating activities in my focus block. So let me ask a different question for you. Have you built the business? Or have you built a job for yourself? And what I mean or intend to mean by this is, as we look to operationalize working smarter, the first place is I start with myself. How can I personally work smarter in the business? That's my A, B versus my D level time. That's my focus days versus a push day, and creating focus blocks of time multiple times in the week. That's my setting recurring appointments in my calendar, whether that's Google or, or Outlook or whatever it might be, but recurring appointments so that I can count on that every Tuesday and every Wednesday from certain hours, I know that I've got a block of time. I'm probably not going to get eight hours of focus time in one day. It's tough to do, but I can get one to three hours in a focus day easily, easily by building that in as a recurring appointment. The second part of operationalizing working smarter, and I want to share this with you now, is to leverage your team. So the same thing that you just did for yourself, let's do it with your team. Um, what does your team do that creates the most value and do they know? Does um, Sarah, who runs your marketing, does she know what she does that creates the most value, her A and B level activities? Does Joe, who runs your operations, does he know what he does that creates the most value? Is your team taking focused time, even two hours once a week of a focused block that they can count on to put their best attention on their highest value activity and the flurry of what they've got going on? And have you aligned your team 
so that they're consistently focusing their energy, their best attention on the things that create the most value. There's one more piece and then we call it strategic depth. How do we make sure that we protect ourselves from the loss of a person by investing in the systems, the cross-trained team and backups, and a culture that says this is how we do it? Now, I just gave you a mouthful. If you were to go back and listen to that three more times, you would pull nugget after nugget from that. When I look at the things that have allowed my companies to grow 10, 20, 30 percent compounded annual growth rate for over a decade, I got an initial flurry of growth by me just producing more with my time, right? By me focusing on my A and B level activities. But that's not sustainable. I got the second wave of growth by helping my key leaders in the business personally do better with using their time to do A and B level activities more consistently. The third generation of growth in the companies that I've run over the last 20 plus years have come from how do we get the company to have this discipline, to eat our own cooking, to have this discipline of making sure that each of the team members know what do you do that creates the most value, making sure that they have a little bit of focus time every week to do their most valuable task. I don't want my person to look at their to-do list, and, and, and this is what most people see on their to-do list, right? It's, it's like they've got all these check boxes of things that they need to do. And this list goes way, way down. I mean, it has way too much to do. And what they do is they, they pick one item and work on it. But in here, you've hidden away your highest value activities. What I want you to do is to say, I've defined out in advance which of these things are your highest value activities. And make sure that this week, some of your best attention goes on those highest value activities. The other stuff, you can just check the box, get it done. But you want to do really well your high value activities. And an example of how this might look like in your business, you know, we have a tool that we use called the Hiring Gold Standard whenever we're hiring new staff members. We use the same thing with several thousand business coaching clients over the years. What we discover is that most people as business owners, they don't really have a process to hire good people. Part of that Hiring Gold Standard includes the role description. What is it this person's supposed to do? You're responsible to do X, Y, and Z. You own one, two, and three. These are the responsibilities that you have. But the second part of that role description has to be, here's how you create the most value. Of all the things you do, Joe, here are the two things that create the most value. And here's how success for you is measured. If I do that up front before I hire, then when Joe comes on and I hire him, now not only have I hired to that gold standard, but I get to go to Joe and say, hey, Joe, Here's all you're responsible for, but these two or these four things are where you create the most value. Really important to do that so that Joe has a very clear picture of what does he need to do to create the most value for the business. As a matter of fact, it goes further. I'm going to actually, over time, have my key staff members do that time value matrix tool just like, just like you should do with your staff. Start with yourself. Once you've kind of got a feel for this over the course of two, three, four months that you're consistently building in blocks of best time to do your high value activities, go to your top one, two, or three people and have them repeat and replicate that. Maybe at first they can only get one focus block on Tuesday for two or three hours and then a one hour block on a Thursday. And if that's all they have to start with, that three or four hours of time that they've reclaimed to focus on higher value activities, then start with that. That's going to build value. It's not that they're only going to do the high value stuff. You know, without that, the company and the business falls apart. But you want them to focus their discretionary time, that their discretionary two hours, six hours, eight hours a week on their highest value work. Which brings me to the next su suggestion I have for you, which is we talk about in, our, in any coaching client that relationship we have, that every quarter we want a one page quarterly action plan. Um, and that one page quarterly action plan should focus out that of all the things you could do this quarter, here's what we as a department, here's what we as a company have as our most important, most valuable focus areas, two or three of them, the criteria of success for each of them, what needs to happen by the end of this quarter in this area for us to be successful, and then we lay out the action steps and milestones. By doing that, most people manage by this to-do list, but if I can start off here with my quarterly action plan and that quarterly action plan needs to and this is really important it needs to be one page if it's more than one page you just won't use it 
And that quarterly action plan focuses on the top one, two, possibly three focus areas for the quarter. Every quarter it lays out. Here's the criteria of success in these focus areas. And then, of course, it's going to lay out just in broad strokes way what are the action steps and milestones and who does what by when. It's going to happen in one page summary. So now that I have that, I know that this describes what my highest value contribution activities could be this quarter. You know, 60 to 85% of what I have to do is just getting my stuff done. But somewhere between 15% and maybe as much as 40% of my best energy goes into this action plan, getting these things done superbly well. So I plan each quarter, but I come back and I execute on a weekly basis on a weekly basis. We talk about this in our coaching program as a big rock report. Let me share the concept with you right now because the same thing applies. So the average person, they have all their to-dos in their, in their, in their to-do list, their master to-do list. Some of you have it on your phone. Some of you have it on sheets of paper. Some of you have it in a journal, a bullet journal perhaps, or a day timer. What I'm going to share with you is that a to-do list hides the high value stuff. So at the beginning of each week when you plan your week or at the end of each week when you plan the following week, depending how you do it. I want you to take a look at your quarterly action plan. Just pause for a moment and say, of this plan, what would be the most important one or two things from this plan that I should plan into this coming week's work? We call these your big rocks. Remember I went before and shared that example of, of how you have this inventory of certain amount of working hours. We put our blocks of our focus time in first and then they displace the lower value stuff, the lower value D activities. Um, so, for example, if I go back and I say I have my, every Tuesday I've got a three hour focus block and every Thursday I've got a one hour focus block, that's only four hours. I might say that of these different things to do, I've got two items here that I could get done. This one action step here, I'm going to put into that first focus block and the second action step is the other. And these two steps become my big rocks for the week. Come heck or high water, I'm going to get these big rocks done. I might not get everything done on the week of my to-do list, but these most important two things get done. Matter of fact, they're so important that we have clients pull them separately. Now, this is an a, a example of a paper-based way of doing it, but we tend to do it more technology with an app that we use with clients. They're going to pick their top one, two, or three big rocks for the week. And then at the end of the week, they're going to have responsibility because this gets shared with your executive team or this gets shared with their manager or this gets shared with your peers, depending who it is. So for example, I share my big rock report um, with our executive team. I also share it with my wife. I put her on the distribution list to get it, just because I want her to know what's going on. But when I have my big rocks, if I don't check them off that they're done at the end of the week, I have to face my executive team and say, hey, um, I didn't get done what I said I was going to get done this week of the most valuable stuff. I have a to-do list that goes 20, 30 items every week. I don't get them all done. But 85, 90% of the time, my big rocks, the one, two, or three things, those got done. And they didn't just get checked off. They got my best attention over the course of that week. I want the same thing for you and for your business. It's an incredibly powerful way of scaling a company. You know? And when you think about it, again, whether you use the, the app version or you use the, the paper version or you use some work around yourself. The idea behind it is it allows you as a business person to focus your energies on the most valuable items that come from your action plan that get put into you planning in each week. And then during your focus blocks of time, that's when you do your big rocks most times. Most times. Every once in a while, some emergency that's high value comes up. You got to deal with it. But again, you just need to be, we tell our coaching clients all the time, be 80% or better, be a B minus business owner or better, and you're gonna get a fantastic result. If you're consistent with these time suggestions that I've given to you, these, these strategies, and you're doing it 80, 85% of the time or better, you're gonna have an incredible burst of growth. And if you follow through with these things and apply them not just to you, but to your key leaders, and eventually throughout your company, you're gonna sustain those bursts of growth and turn those into some truly compelling compounded annual growth rates in your company. All right, I want to shift over and talk about two more items here. One is I want to talk about how to leverage your personal assistant. Now, I don't know if you have a personal assistant. If you don't, I'm going to try to convince you that it's a good move, whether that personal assistant is someone who sits outside your office and is there physically, whether there's someone who is virtually. Um, for example, you know, 
since, what, 1997, um, the companies that I built have all been, quote unquote, virtual. Before there was such a thing as a virtual company. You know, um, I remember one of the businesses that I sold, we had 85 or 90 staff members that were scattered throughout North America. None of them worked from the same office. They were all, quote unquote, virtual before we knew it. And it just worked. And we've kept that. So the assistance I've had, I've had people who have been locally based, and I have people who have been distance. Today's world, I actually have um, three different people who play that assistant role for me, two of whom are remote, one of whom is local. The local person, I get probably somewhere between 10 to 15 hours a week of her time. Um, the other two, I get probably another 20 to 40 hours a week of their time, depending on the week and what my needs are with that part. So it could be all of one person full time there locally. You could have 10 hours of somebody virtually. But I want to talk right now about the different levels of virtual assistance, the different levels of assistance. So the first level of an assistant is what I would call a gopher. This is the person you tell, hey, do this, go get that. You, there's someone who you basically are tasking in a very closely managed way, really not very valuable. The second level of assistance is what I call just a pure administrative assistant. This is someone who's capable of doing something well if you've clearly defined it, you've given them a process for it, and it's, it's a clear outcome, and it's something to do uh, that's been explicitly assigned to them, and generally it has to be something that's in the, in the framework of, of operations or administrative types of duties. You know, you can't, even if you spell it out great, you're not going to get an admin to do a sales call on your behalf. He or she is going to be uncomfortable with that. So it tends to have to be much more of a, of a core administrative type of function, but they can handle it. If it's been defined out and given to them, a good admin can do it really well and consistently. The third level is what I would call an executive assistant. Now, an executive assistant is someone who's extremely competent. They can hand, take, when you give them a, 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 I call it a fuzzy handoff, you can give them something to do that isn't necessarily so easy, it hasn't been totally detailed out, and they can figure it out. You can also sometimes even give to them tasks that have ambiguity that they will then take on and own and figure out. Um, they tend to want to understand what you're trying to accomplish and help you do that. But again, they tend to be more of an administrative person. You're not going to have an executive assistant probably taking on things like um, creating new marketing materials for your company or um, dealing with the financial review of your P&L or balance sheet. They're not going to do those things for you. They don't have quite that sophistication in business to do that. But they are extremely powerful as a right-hand person for you to, to start things and hand them over to them for them to continue with. Now, there's one more level, which I'll call the chief of staff. This is like your own personal COO uh, for yourself. This person is incredibly competent, incredibly capable as a broad business person. And they have tremendous follow-through so that when you want to do, when you're, for example, let's say you're meeting with your marketing team. They can be the person that follows up on those marketing deliverables and makes sure that that marketing plan gets done. Let's say you're meeting to negotiate on a contract with a particular vendor. They can be the one to help make sure that all the, the I's get dotted and the T's get crossed. Very rare that you're going to find a chief of staff in a business that's less than probably $20 million a year in revenue. For our clients that have 20, 50, 100 million dollar businesses, many of them do have a chief of staff um, for that owner. Generally speaking, for you, the first goal for you should be, how can I find a great executive assistant should be the goal for you. Um, you'll get tremendous bang for the buck. Now, a couple of blinding flashes of the obvious. The first is, can I make delegating to my assistant easy and convenient for me? Um, you know, when we're working, I'm going to share with you an example for this. When we're working with a, a new assistant in my company, one of the tools we have, um, I'm going to share the concept here about working with a great assistant says, how do I know myself? Like, I've actually done this for myself. For example, I'm fairly introverted. I don't like lots of conversation. I tend to be someone who wants to be able to delegate auditorily. Because for me, if I can delegate auditorily, what it allows me to do is to do it just by talking it. That's where I'm at my best. If you make me type it out or text it out, I don't like to do that. If you make me have another mind-numbing meeting with an assistant to give them a whole bunch of stuff, it doesn't work. 15, 20 years ago, I used to meet with my assistant once, twice a week, and for half an hour or 45 minutes, and I would have a whole stack, a whole folder of stuff that I would delegate to them. 
it would be so much at once. I used to have my assistant have a recorder and she would be responsible to record that, to go back and listen a second or a third time. It's crazy. It did hit the part of me that was an auditory delegator, but it was a very inefficient way and not very enjoyable. So how do I make it easy and convenient for me to delegate? I'm auditory, so I use my phone. Uh, for me, if on here, there's a, an app on my phone called Voxer. And so on Voxer, I actually can delegate to any of my team members on here, press a button, I can leave an audio message for them instantly. Now you could use WhatsApp or texting to do the same thing, if that's how you want to do it. I like doing audio messages. You might want to do a quick screen grab video for them. Or some of you might want to meet in person. There's no right or wrong way to delegate, but you need to ask, what would make delegating easy and convenient for you? And then you hire the assistant who can work well with that style, who can accommodate your style. And that's a really important thing. I showed you this before, this idea that I want to start off by knowing, what do I know about myself? For example, what is it that I need about my work environment? And what's my information style? And um, what are my preferences for, do I want information coming in by them sharing it with me auditorily? No, I hate when assistants give me an auditory update. I hate it. Um, for me, I would much prefer an assistant to give me a written update. I can read three times faster than I can listen. Plus, I usually print up their email and I can just make my notes right on it. And then I go for a walk around my office pacing around using my audio Voxer to give them back answers to questions that they had when it's convenient for me. Usually it's after a focus block of time. I want some a little bit of downtime that I can do something valuable, but it doesn't take a lot of brain power at that moment. That works for me. You have to find your own delegation style with your assistant, but it should be what works best for you. Um, now, one of the things I want to encourage you to do is to make part of your assistant's job to create the system for how to be a great assistant for you. Now, inside the Maui community, when we look at the people we coach, we talk about building your UBS. Now, the idea behind a UBS is it's one place that you create. It's the master system of how you create, store, access, edit, refine, update, and even at times delete systems. We call that your UBS. It simply stands for the ultimate business system. It's a term that my business partner and I years ago came up with, 20, 24, 25 years ago, we came up with it and it stuck. And the idea behind it, it's the, where do we store? Where do we edit? Where do we access? Where do we organize the systems that we have? And it's in one place. And we call that your UBS. So part of your assistant's job is to build the UBS for how to be a world-class assistant for you. So that if Debbie is your assistant for four years and then she has a change in career, that when um, Jonathan comes in to be your new assistant, he starts with four years worth of accumulated knowledge that is easy to transfer him, just like we do in other areas of our businesses. And it's a really important thing. Now I want to talk one more idea. I know this is a long podcast, but I'm hoping that you've got a lot of ideas that are very valuable for you about how to upgrade your use of time. So I want to give you one more coaching suggestion. And we talk about this as how can, can you use the calendaring function inside your, your Outlook or Google as the tickler system for your appointments. And I'm going to give a couple examples for this. So for example, if you have an appointment coming up, I will have my assistant put everything in that appointment memo I need for that assistant. So for example, let me come back here for a second. Let me just kind of share it this way. 25 years ago, I'd go on a trip, for example, and I would leave the office and my assistant, at that time it would have been, um, actually I think it probably would have been Judy maybe back then. Judy would hand me a manila folder and in that manila folder would have my itinerary. It would have tickets. It, for example, let's say it was a fun trip, a vacation. It might have tickets like this one here that has um, taking my, my family to go see uh, Hamilton in Salt Lake City um, this summer. I have my tickets in this folder for that trip. So it could be a physical based thing. In today's world though, I don't really want physical based things because it's too easy to lose. Plus, I don't know where I'll be. I like having everything right there in my calendar and so I'll have it in my Outlook so I can access it by my phone, by my tablet, my laptop, my desktop computer, any of those things are ways that I or my staff can access what they need to with that. And so that appointment might be a phone call. For example, let's say I'm meeting with 
a group of people and I'm doing a training for, their, for them. I might have 75 people on a training that I'm doing a distance-based training. Well, let's say I have a, a spreadsheet that has all the names of people who will be on there. And I'll have the login for the Zoom that I need for that to run that meeting. Let's say that I've got an appointment in my office with a particular person from my local bank. And so it might be something like I'll have Danielle coming over and great. So I've got the, 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 the email thread that we've had about what we're going to discuss is right there pasted by my assistant into that appointment memo. It works exceptionally well. And that appointment memo becomes the place where I store the different documents, whether it's an attachment or whether it's just pure information based off of that that I'm storing that way. The place to store time-specific information when I have to have access to it at a specific date and time, it is your calendar. It used to be that you'd have to do this with a tickler-based system of manila folders or hanging folders in your desk. Today's world, use your, use your Outlook calendar, use your Google calendar. It's a perfect place to store that type of date-specific information so that you can just show up and all the information's there. Can you imagine how cool that would be? Let's say you and I were going to have meet and we were going to do a coaching session and you had two or three emails we traded back and forth and you'd had a prep doc that you had done. Rather than scrambling at the last minute to find all those things before we sat down in your office to go through it, wouldn't it be really cool if you just opened up your appointment memo and right there was the spreadsheet. Right there were the four emails back and forth between us. Right there was the prep Word doc that you had had. Now, some of you, like me, are probably going to want to not just have it uh, on your phone, but at times you're going to want to have the physically printed up stuff. Right? When I'm going on a trip, I, I like to have, I have this, it's probably unsubstantiated fear of what happens if I lost my phone or I broke my phone? You know, does that mean my family and I can't go see Hamilton because the tickets won't be able to be accessed on my phone? So I like having the physical based stuff or tickets for the airline. I like the physical. You know, I don't want to go up to the front of that line, put my, my phone down on the thing and for some reason it's not reading me, uh, my phone for the, 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 the tickets, not reading that code. I like the physical. But I store it all on the phone or my computer by using that Outlook that's synced across all these different devices. And it's a really wonderful way to save time. All right. So I want to ask you a question here. What for you from this podcast today, what for you was your single biggest insight from today? I want you to pick one. Maybe for you it's the distinction between A, B versus D level time with that time value matrix we've built applying the 80-20 principle a second and a third time. Maybe for you is this idea of creating recurring blocks of appointments on your phone. Remember the story, show me your phone. If it's not there as a recurring appointment on your phone, then I know that likely you're not doing it. Maybe for you it was about um, creating a block of focus time once per week or three times over the course of the week. Or maybe you liked it, David, wow, I liked how you had it. Every Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, you've got yourself with most of that time. You know, I'm going to start off with every Monday um, from 11 o'clock to 1 o'clock. I'm going to close my office door and do focus time there and every Thursday morning from 7 to 9. Wonderful. Start with that. Maybe for you, you really love the idea of getting your team to know what is it in writing that they do that creates the most value. Remember we talked about the gold standard for hiring and said right at the point of hire, I should know what this person is responsible for. But in the second half of that description, I should know what do they do that actually creates the most value and how is that value measured? So if the other person knows that in writing, they now can put their best energy on the highest value stuff. Remember we talked about the first generation or wave of growth in your company is going to come from you personally upgrading your use of time. You're going to sustain that and get a second wave of growth by getting your best people to do the same thing. But for you to sustain this growth for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, like, like I've seen in my companies and the clients that we coach, you're going to need to make this part of how your company does time as a cultural element that we focus our best energy as a company on creating value, not just on time served. Maybe for you, your big takeaway was about the personal assistant. Hmm, David, I love what you said about making delegating to my assistant easy and convenient for me based on my style and hiring that person who can meet my need versus me accommodating them. And David, maybe for you, you say, hey, I really love that idea of creating that tickler system in your calendar so that date and time specific information is immediately accessible to you just by pulling it up on your phone, your iPad, your laptop, or your desktop computer. All right. 
Well, thank you for spending the last period of time with me here on the Business uh, Coach Podcast. I really wish you the very best success as you apply these ideas into your company. And as always, I'd love to hear from you, right? Let us know, how is it going applying these ideas? If you've got questions based on today's episode, you know, share them in the comments for it. We'd be happy to get you back answers about that. This is a, a work of passion. It is what we do professionally. This is the core of what we do for clients, coaching them on their companies. But it is something that also for me is a work of passion. This is a passion project. I wish you the very best of luck.